Hi, I'm Steve Goodman, and today I want to talk about how you can deal with your last Exchange server. So after you've moved your mailboxes and maybe public folders to Exchange Online, then if you're still running Active Directory on-premises, then you still usually need to run Exchange Server, primarily if you've got Azure AD connect in place, because this is known as hybrid identity. So AD remains the master, all of your attributes that relate to Exchange, like proxy addresses, mailbox recipient types, and so on, they're all managed from on-prem AD. And the tool Microsoft support to do that is naturally Exchange Server. Now, they have promised that they'll get rid of this, and you can find more about this in my tech session and on Practical 365. But if you're keeping that server around for now, I wanted to talk through some top tips for dealing with that last one or two Exchange servers while you've still got them. So the first one is minimize your Exchange infrastructure. So let's say you've moved Exchange 2016 mailboxes to the cloud and you had a DAG, maybe a multi-site DAG, or oh, preferred architecture. And well, you need to minimize that now. What you'll probably find is that you don't need to build out a whole bunch of new physical servers for this. Virtual machines will suffice. If you've got a lot of mail relay going through these boxes, then you'll need to consider transport uh, and sizing for mail queues. But in general, actually, you know, you, the, the minimum specifications for Exchange aren't going to be quite there. But you will be fine with something like two to four virtual CPUs, 12 gig of RAM, maybe 16 gig of RAM. You know, RAM is cheap in virtual machines as well these days, to be frank. Uh, and 100 to 200 gig of space. You know, you don't need a lot to keep these running because they're not running mailboxes. You know, you're going to have a mailbox database on there naturally for the things that you actually need. But you don't need to size these out because for the free hybrid license, well, you can't run mailboxes on them, it's, it is for relay, it's for exchange management. Uh, and they're not really, well, they shouldn't be providing true hybrid services. Clients should not be accessing these. Now, the other one of these is that I get asked a lot is, well, should I upgrade to Exchange Server 2019? Now, there's a few cases where, well, if you really don't care about the cost and you want to buy some new copies of Exchange Server, standard edition or enterprise edition, um, then, then you can, right? Uh, and you get a few small benefits. So you'll be able to run it on server core, uh, Exchange 2019 to support in place OS upgrades. Uh, but how long realistically do you think it's going to be until Microsoft deal with this? Okay, they've been promising for a long time, but it, it is getting to that point now where we are expecting that to be an imminent solution. And things over the last few years have changed priorities somewhat but it will come soon enough. And they have committed on the Exchange Team blog and my article on Practical 365, which you'll see linked down below, does tell you where to find that statement from Microsoft that says we will deal with this. Um, so you can stay on Exchange 2016, even though it's in extended support. So stay on Exchange 2016. That's the last version you'll get a free hybrid license for. You don't need to upgrade to Exchange Server 2019. Okay. Now, what else have we got? We've got a whole bunch of these here. So, oh, don't publish the last Exchange server to the internet. I mean, why would you, right? You know, no one's accessing it. Surely you're not you're not sitting at home connecting with Exchange Remote PowerShell. I hope. Um, <laughs> at least if you are, don't. Uh, you shouldn't need this published to the internet. So if you have it published, you've still got your load balances in place, valid SSL certificates and so on. Uh, why? Why? You know, even if you've got pre-authentication in front of it and all sorts, you shouldn't need to do this anymore. Um, if you've not been patching your exchange servers religiously, then you've exposed you know, yourself to, to some unnecessary risk. One reason why people do is because after they finish their migration, they've, they've perhaps not cleaned up properly and they've left Autodiscover published. And when you are doing an Exchange hybrid migration, you will keep um, Autodiscover pointed at on-premises so that new clients will discover where their mailbox is um, by first looking up the Autodiscover record for your domain. That will then attempt to authenticate to Exchange on-premises. That will then find 
a remote mailbox uh, with a target address which will point at your alias at your tenant name dot mail dot on Microsoft dot com. It'll return that in an auto discover response, which will then tell the client to redirect that request over to Exchange Online. And once you've moved the last mailbox, you can set the SCP to null. So you can set client access service, auto discover service, internal URI, null, null that out um, so that the auto discover lookup for domain join clients doesn't find that. And those DNS records, they can be moved. Uh, so you auto discover dot practical365.com or whatever, that can be moved to the cloud as well. It's no longer needed. And uh, the auto discover records on modern Outlook clients, you know, if the if the Outlook client actually finds that there's a mailbox licensed, it's signed into Office 365, tenant using Microsoft 365 apps for enterprise or business, then it's going to discover where the mailbox is anyway without auto discover. But good housekeeping, move that over to the cloud. Again, you don't need to publish this to the internet. And I was talking about this on our live stream with Michael Van Horenbeek, who said, well, actually, if it's just management purposes and you patch it and bring it online, you know, a few times a week, perhaps for new recipients or making changes to users, then you could actually shut down the server because if it's not being used for anything apart from management, you might not need it. If you do need it for things like Mail Relay at the moment, then again, you could consider restricting that. Now, Exchange servers do need any-to-any -any firewall rules between Exchange servers and AD domain controllers. There's a whole bunch of documentation from Microsoft over the years that states what those requirements are. But clients don't need to access the Exchange servers. For years, you know, organizations that have effectively had to do a zero-trust model, universities, for example, have blocked student access direct to their Exchange servers uh, and treated them almost like external clients. You can do the same because if your clients don't need to access those Exchange servers, the Outlook clients, your users, what are they What are they accessing on Exchange? They shouldn't be accessing anything. So you could consider restricting access because they don't need that. You know, it's a small group of administrators that need to be able to get into the Exchange uh, Admin Center on Exchange 2016 for, you know, fairly routine tasks, again, for, for PowerShell usually from restricted workstations, which will be locked to VLAN or, or particular IP addresses. So again, you know, you can reduce the, the risk, even though you're still patching. And it, it almost goes without saying in today's world that you shouldn't install Exchange Server on the same server as, as other things. You know, definitely not AD, even though, you know, in the world of small business server, it's supported, but those very, very high risk targets like Active Directory domain controllers. Uh, and you know, another core one of those is your Azure AD Connect servers. They are that uh, they are they should be treated with the same respect as domain controllers. Don't install Exchange on those either. That's not a great idea. Um, you know, there's potentially some small edge cases where that might be okay, but you shouldn't do it today. Just don't do it. Install it on a VM on its own, you know, if you just need the one for management purposes. Uh, keep it to itself and keep it patched and up to date. And SMTP Relay is sort of the big thing. And I've always thought that perhaps the reason Microsoft haven't prioritised removing the last Exchange server, um, the reason for that is that, well, they know that people still need SMTP Relay. And if you read my, my article, I, I I go into this in a bit more detail on Practical 365, but vendors have had a long time to think about this uh, as, a, as something to solve because people have been moving to Exchange Online for like 10 years now, longer if you count live at EDU uh, or BPOS. This isn't new to them. So if you speak to your vendor and you're on a call and they're saying, Steve... We've never been asked about whether our application can send mail directly through Exchange Online before. Then, oh, that they they can't be being honest with you. Um, perhaps they're just perhaps they've spoken to somebody else in the in their organisation um, who hasn't, um, or perhaps they've not spoken to the right person. They must have heard about this as a requirement, and it's been about two years now since Microsoft said all of the, the stuff in Exchange Online is moving to OAuth. So IMAP. POP3, SMTP, you know, those legacy protocols, um, they can't be authenticated against with basic auth, so they'll have to use OAuth. So if your vendor is saying, 
yes, we can work with Exchange Online. And you're looking at it and going, maybe not, though, because you, you want to use basic auth. Then, well, they, they've had two years to do this. This isn't, a, you're not a special case. Everybody is in that scenario, all of their other customers. So if they haven't started developing their software to use either OAuth, if they pick up from either that mailboxes and send out via SMTP, um, or they haven't started developing the software to use the Graph API, then what are they doing? And if they refuse to do anything, or it's applications that you've developed in house and the person has long since departed, and it, it, you know there's twenty of them that you you know you're never going to get through, then you need to find another solution. And I talked through some of these in the article, but potentially Exchange Edge transport servers that can be installed in a perimeter network in a DMZ, they're not domain joined, could be a, a good way of being able to, re to, to remove those Exchange servers, or perhaps even today, move your receive connectors across to those instead. So they use those as relay boxes. In a normal hybrid scenario, then you would have Edge Sync and it would be a fully integrated thing with your hybrid environment. But in the future, with no Exchange servers in your environment, then well, what you might expect is that these are similar to standard OSS open source type MTAs where they are standalone and they've got a small config where they've got a list of IPs for those legacy servers that you'll never get rid of that are allowed to relay. Again, you know, multifunction copiers. I mean, he's in an office copying. Not so many people these days. The market for that, the bottom has fallen out of it, right? But maybe you've still got them, right? And you've got to allow them to relay. Well, that could be your solution. You could also roll your own. There's a lot of good MTAs out there. Back in the days when I used to work at university, well, I used to run XIM, and it's a fantastic email server. It's not without its own security risks. Um, send mail is okay, hard to configure. Postfix, again, you know, not too bad, easy to configure. Uh, but if you're not a Linux expert, Unix, FreeBSD, OpenBSD, or wh whatever floats your boat, if that's not things you are experienced in, then the support for those, unless you buy a distribution like Red Hat Enterprise Linux with a support contract, similar cost to Windows servers, you know, is, is little to non-existent. You won't get the kind of help from the open source community always. You know, you'll you'll be expected to have done your own research. And of course, you know, if you don't know about Linux, then those machines could be compromised and you wouldn't even know it. So it, it's a solid thing if you have that experience. But if you don't, then you know, do do some decent research first. Or of course there's third party solutions. You know, if you want to use a third party service, um, you know, you can buy appliances for these. Uh, if you want to, that can do SMTP relay, or you can use third-party services as well. Uh, one of the comments on the blog post uh, was, well, you know, we, we when we moved to Exchange Online, then there were limits on how many uh, mails we could send. Those limits still exist. But I'm talking about that scenario today where you're relaying some application server traffic maybe into Exchange Online. It's going unsecured via SMTP to these on-prem exchange servers and then it's being relayed over TLS secure channel into exchange online either to your users maybe it's your notifications from your uh, logging appliance uh, or, or similar or maybe it is a small amount of email that is going outside to for customer notifications service tickets and and so on and it's it has to come from your domain um, if you are going to another solution that's going to relay outside of your organization then Factors like DKIM and DMARC mean that you'll probably need to use a subdomain for those. So, you know, uh, mail relay or marketing.practical365.com so that it doesn't uh, either get rejected or fall into people's junk email. So, consider what your solution is now because when Microsoft do come with, out with a solution and you want to be ready to go, you don't want it to be legacy mail relay that holds you back. So, talk to your vendors, be firm with them. You know, I know it's hard. I have to do this myself. And it's difficult because you're talking to people you know and often, or they, they, they mean well, but you do have to be firm with them because they, they know that this is coming. They know that they need to do this. So you've got that, that choice or you've got an alternative solution to consider, right? And keep the server up to date. You, you can see the other videos on this channel, live streams, Oh, it's so important. You know, even if you're running it 
internally. You've got no mailboxes on it. Sure, every single vulnerability that you know wisely is getting found and dealt with by by Microsoft and security researchers who are finding this stuff. It's it's not going to affect every single Exchange hybrid server scenario, uh, like the most recent one. If you're not running mailboxes, you might not be at risk. But there's other stuff to consider as well. So keep the server up to date, even if it's not published to the outside world. It's important to do so. And the question on uh, what one of the most recent blogs on this again was: I thought Microsoft said don't run antivirus on my Exchange server. Now th- th- there certainly was a time where this could be troublesome and. That the, there was some sort of train of thought years and years ago that it could cause problems. And to be frank, you know, I used to run McAfee EPO, and once or twice, the rules all, all reset and it blocked SMTP between some 2007 hub transport servers. <gasps> it's a horrible, horrible morning. Um, rare, but that's not a reason to um, not run antivirus on the servers. That's that's rare. It's you know, it's necessary risk versus the alternative. So use all of the the guidance from Microsoft, which is there that tells you what exclusions for obviously SMTP traffic. So it doesn't block it, obviously. So it doesn't try and scan exchange log files and databases. You know, that that's common stuff. It's been documented for at least 10 years now. And there's documentation. If you're using Defender for Endpoint, uh, what's now Plan 2, um, as your uh, uh, endpoint detection and response solution, then there's guidance for how to use that with Exchange Server, you know, what it can do to help protect against unusual activity on those those servers as well. And either get a SOC service based on Sentinel, ideally, or, well, if you're planning and in the process of building out SOC yourself, then make sure it covers Exchange because it's one of those things that hybrid servers, they can get left behind, right? You know, it's it's important and it will continue to be important as well. And, you know, I've not said it in this video today, but it it is always, always crucial. You know, you need to make sure that you keep skills up to date with Exchange. You know, if you're bringing people into the business, you know, new IT pros who are cloud born, they still need these skills. You know, what we saw early in the year was it's not quite a lost art, but it's getting there. And, that shouldn't be the case. You know, a lot of uh, experienced exchange admins have moved on to to do other things because, you know, you've been told that there's no future in you being an exchange admin. You're not going to go and find another job administering exchange in many other places, given everybody else has moved to the cloud. Uh, and if you saw the video that we did um, with Ingo, then, you know, Ingo is still managing exchange, but in the cloud, there's a lot to do there as well. But those on-premises skills you need to maintain for as long as you've got Exchange on-prem. And if you're delegating that management task to uh, your new up-and-coming excited experts in the business, then you need to help them with this. You know, impart some of your knowledge, point them at some really good training resources, get them up to speed so that they don't pass this by and think it's something, you know, we just use for management, don't worry about it. You know, it's still something very, very important. And get ready, get preparing for that point when you can remove the last exchange server because that will be a, a great day and you don't want to be the last person out the door removing your exchange server, surely. Uh, so join me at Tech on the 2nd of September. Uh, I'll be talking about this in more detail. And of course, keep tuned to the Practical 365 podcast and hit the subscribe and like button below.